All right. Well, I'd like to uh, welcome everyone to uh, today's edition of the uh, Polyplity webinar. Uh, before we get started today with two great talks, um, I want to just uh, advertise a, a couple of events happening in our community uh, this year. So uh, first of all, we have the uh, Polyplity conference that's taking place uh, in uh, Florida in May, uh, May 9th to the 12th. Uh, go to polyplityconference.org uh, to uh, find out more information and about registering, submitting abstracts. I believe abstracts are due on February 17th. So um, be sure to check that out and uh, join us for, uh, you know, what's always a great meeting. Our, our last meeting was in 2019 in, uh, in Ghent. Uh, and uh, I think this might be the first one in this series of meetings that's been going on since early 2000s uh, to be held here in the US. So um, it, it should be a great time and there are great accommodations and, and things that have been reserved for the meeting. So I encourage you to check those out. Um, the other issue that I want to raise real quick here is our double issue of the American Journal of Botany and Applications in Plant Sciences, a uh, special issue on polyploidy. So that we have a, had a call that's been open for a, a couple of months now. Uh, we just extended the deadline. So originally proposals were due uh, today, uh, but we've extended that deadline a couple of weeks and we'll be reading and uh, uh, making decisions on the proposals for those, those special issues. Uh, here at the end of the month. So please uh, feel free to send those in. And uh, if you're thinking about getting one, if you're a little bit late, don't worry. There's still time to, to get that submitted. Um, and I really would like to, we've got a great collection so far and it'd be really fun to see some more in there. Um, and uh, really looking forward to uh, getting those issues together. Uh, uh, it, it's been a lot of fun, a really diverse collection of papers. Um, and so if you have any questions about whether or not your paper would fit, feel free to send my, send me an email and I can, Give you any guidance on that. Uh, uh, all right, well, let's go ahead and get going with today's uh, polyploid webinar. So we've got two great speakers, and up first is uh, Elise Perry. Uh, Elise is, uh, did her PhD under the supervision of Camille Bertolo and Hugh Gross Crolius at Ivens in Paris uh, at ENS there, where she studied the evolution of teleost uh, genes and genomes after their ancient whole genome duplication. Uh, and this is work that she'll be presenting to us today. Uh, this past summer, she joined uh, uh, the Mar Marlitaz Lab at the University of Co at the University College London as a postdoctoral fellow, where she's working on comparative and functional genomics in echinoderms. Uh, this is the clade that includes starfish and sea urchins. So a lot of really exciting animal work uh, going on there, and uh, I'm really looking forward to hearing about her work here on delayed reduplication following the teleost whole genome duplication. With that, Elise, please uh, take it away. Thank you. Um, thanks. Thanks a lot for the introduction and. Uh, thank you for inviting me to present. Um, I've been watching quite a few of the Polypolity webinar over the years, so it's cool to be here. And so, yes, I've been working on whole genome duplication in terrorist fishes, um, which um, are one of the, if not the most diverse cl clade of vertebrates. And just for context, this includes, for instance, the famous zebrafish, uh, but also other model organisms for biomedical research, such as uh, platyfish, and more generally, uh, a lot of um, groups that are of interest for uh, ecological, evolutionary, or uh, functional genomics. And um, in addition, there are also uh, a great group to study um, whole gene duplication. And that is because all of those uh, 25,000, more than 25,000 uh, Tilia species descend from one ancient whole genome duplication uh, that we believe occurred 300, around 300 million years ago. And um, of course, as you can imagine, um, because the duplication is so ancient, most of all of the uh, Tilia are redeployedized from, from this event. Um, Two days genomes are, are redeployedized. And also because it is so ancient, um, it has been sort of hard to characterize and to understand how this redeployization occurred, um, how uh, gene losses um, and return to duplicate set occurred over um, over time, and uh, that is in contrast in contrast with uh, other duplication that occurred in fish, um, for instance in salmonids and carps that are a bit more um, recent and are a bit more characterized. Um, and for instance, we know that uh, salmonids underwent um, um, an ancient auto-polyplodization event, and for caps, we believe it was an allo uh, polyplodization event. But for the for the, the duplication, we don't uh, really know. 
And so uh, the questions that we were asking is how this redeploidization process occurred after the Telios genome duplication. And by that, I mean, uh, in what sort of time frame did it occur? Um, whether it was or not homogeneous over the genome, um, if we see differences uh, across homologous um, in terms of uh, gene retention, for instance, all those kinds of questions. And ultimately, um, do these redeploidization processes provide clues into the origins of the TGD? So can we say whether it was most likely an auto or an allo tetraploidy? And so uh, to try to answer those questions, we started by uh, tracing the evolution of TDS genes after their genome duplication event. Um, then we use we built upon those results at the gene scale to go to the chromosome scale and trace the evolution of uh, chromosomes following the Telios gene duplication. And finally, uh, we combined all those information to try to study radicalization and um, investigate the origins of the Telios duplication. And so I'll start with um, the evolution of genes. And so, um, as you are aware, um, we have well-established uh, methodology to reconstruct the evolutionary history of genes. And that is, we start from um, building gene families, and then for each gene family, we build a sequence alignment, and then we have sophisticated uh, substitution uh, models to try to reconstruct the most likely tree uh, from this sequence alignment, that is the evolutionary history of genes. And for instance, in Tiliost, um, we have here the outgroup gene and then the duplication and two copies in the descending uh, species. And that is a real example of gene families in, in Tiliost. But um, one of the challenges when we have many duplicated gene copies is that um, because this sequence alignment is not uh, is typically, typically quite short, we only have one gene, um, it often happens that there's not just one um, possibility, there's just a bunch of trees that are equally supported by the sequence alignment and that we cannot really reject based on sequence uh, evolution alone. And so um, to tackle this challenge, we developed a new method, a new method that we called Scorpius. And the idea of Scorpius is to complement this information that we have from sequence by another kind of information, which is um, synteny. And um, in the context of uh, whole genome duplication, this um, synteny conservation pattern are particularly informative. And so I'm just going to try to explain um, what we, um, how we use synteny uh, in the framework of Scorpius. So again, this is a, a real example. We have one. Uh, 15 gene long genomic segment in one non duplicated outgroup. And as I mentioned, the duplication is quite old, but uh, at this very, very local state, um, local, local scale, what we see is that the two uh, duplicated uh, regions are still on two different genomic uh, copies in, in the duplicated teleosts. And um, just like in those gene trees, we build, uh, we like group together genes um, that are more similar in terms of sequence. We can also do the same with synteny and group genomic segments that are more similar in terms of the pattern of gene retention and losses. And so that's what we do automatically with Scorpius. We build these two groups here of genomic segments that have a similar, a similar history of gene retention and losses. And when we confront them to the gene trees we built with sequence, uh, in most cases, they, they correspond. So there is an agreement between sequence and synteny. But what we found is that in some cases, uh, for instance, this GRTP1 gene family here, uh, when we project these groups from sequence onto the synteny, we see that there is a conflict and that we would need to exchange those two genes here for the tree to be consistent with synteny. And so, um, in the end, what it tells us is that in these cases where we could not decide based on sequence alignment alone, uh, synteny can help us decide. And so that's really the main idea behind uh, Scorpius, behind how Scorpius works. And one very important point that I'll come back to in, later in the talk 
that we never go against uh, sequence information. So Scorpius only tries to find a gene tree that is consistent both with sequence and synteny. And if the solution proposed by synteny is not consistent with sequence, we keep uh, the sequence-based solution. And so uh, I've been quite quick on that, but that's the main idea behind Scorpius, which we have now um, validated, packaged, uh, and published. And we've shown that um, around 20% of the gene trees from public databases can be improved um, with this method. And we've also shown that this fraction of gene tree to correct goes up uh, with the number of species, uh, number of duplicated species uh, included. So um, with that, I'm going directly to my uh, second point, which is application of Scorpius to a data set of 74 uh, Telios genomes to try to reconstruct the chromosome evolution after the uh, Telios duplication. And so uh, we started from this information that we had from the evolution of genes to try to go to the evolution of chromosomes. And just to introduce a bit the, the context, um, so this is a schematic representation of the state of the art, the art karyotype reconstruction for the pre-duplication telios. So here I'm showing only two chromosomes, but we know that this pre-duplication um, karyotype had 13 chromosomes. And so uh, what Nakatani and colleagues have been able to do is to trace the evolution of this pre-duplication chromosome. And what we want to do is to go from this reconstruction to this one, where we trace the evolution of the post-duplication uh, karyotype. And we need that because we want to see if the different homologues have had different trajectory during reduplication. And again, I'm going to pass quite quickly on this, on how we go from uh, this reconstruction to this one. But basically what we did is that we used the information that we have from the gene tree to identify which um, chromosome are the homologues, right? Because we know that they are supposed to share a lot of homologues from the gene trees. So we just mapped that information into the uh, pre-duplication karyotype to go to this reconstruction. And so, um, as I mentioned, we applied this to a um, data set of 74 Telios fish genomes, so um, the tree here. And I'm showing you how it looks on three example um, Telios genomes. So you've got here the 26 post-duplication chromosome and their location uh, into their uh, modern Telios genomes. And you can see that it's quite rearranged. Uh, maybe Medaka is a bit less rearranged there than other, but other otherwise it's quite uh, reshuffled. And uh, now that we have um, the evolution of genes, the evolution of chromosomes, we can start to ask questions about the reduplication processes. And um, just for context, uh, here is my very um, I'd say simplistic view of Otto and Allo tetraploidy, and I know that in previous talks uh, there's been a lot better uh, introduction to this, especially with respect to Allo tetraploidy than um, this simpli simplified version here. But so um, Otto tetraploidy uh, is when happens when uh, there's duplication occurring within a single species. So in this case, um, all of the homologs homologues are very similar. And so what we expect after auto tetraploidy is that um, we will see recombination between the homologues. And um, this means that we will have prolonged homologous recombination in meiosis and uh, delayed meiosis reduplication. And um, at the other end of the spectrum, we have allo tetraploidy. Uh, which happens when a duplication occurs after an initial hybridization event. And in this case, this, we have two different subgenomes that have um, a certain level of genomic differentiation. And because of this uh, genomic difference, uh, we can happen that uh, we see subgenome dominance, where one of the two subgenomes is more expressed, uh, retains more of the genes under. Um, higher selective pressure. And, um, and this is due to these initial differences in the um, 
different subgenomes. So these are the two sort of signature that we can expect to see in the two extreme case of auto, extreme case of auto and allo uh, tetraploidy. So what we started to do was to see if you can, we could find some signature of um, prolonged homologous uh, recombination in meiosis after the TGD. And for this, we used um, some um, phylogenetic models of uh, delayed meiosis redipolarization. And I'm going to introduce uh, those models that were first proposed uh, by good, uh, beautiful work from um, Dan McQueen's lab, um, who worked on salmonids. And so uh, going back to this uh, Tilia's duplication, I'm just trying to show a bit more uh, detailed view of the timeline of, of events. So we have here uh, the Tilia's duplication, and there's a time frame of around uh, 60 million years approximately uh, between this duplication and the first speciation uh, in Tilios. And this first speciation uh, separates Clupeocephala and Osteoclus from the two main um, Tilios clades. And now we have two uh, different scenarios um, depending on when this um, meiosis redipolarization occurred. So in the first case, this meiosis redipolarization occurs on this ancestral branch. So um, at some point before species divergence. And so um, redipolarization is ancestral. And in the second scenario, um, this redipolarization occurs only after the two uh, group have split. And so it happens independently in each of the two lineages. And so this is called lineage specific redipolarization or uh, more simply, I'm going to call it uh, delayed redipolarization, delayed meiosis resolution. And so if we think back about what it implies about, um, it implies on sequence evolution, uh, analog sequence evolution. So um, before this redipolarization, um, the analogs are just behaving as alleles. They recombine in meiosis um, together um, by homologous recombination. And so they can only start to diverge in, in sequence once this recombination is suppressed. So here it starts to, homolog starts to diverge um, at this point. And in this uh, second scenario, um, they diverge independently in each of the two uh, lineages. And so going back to what it means in terms of uh, gene tree topologies, in this first scenario of ancestral redipolarization here, um, the gene tree topology that we expect is this one, where we have the uh, duplication and then the divergence of A and B copy, because the duplication is ancestral, and then the speciation. But in the case of delayed redipolarization, uh, what we will see is that speciation occurs first and separates um, gene copies between uh, the two lineages, and then A and B, B copy uh, diverge within each lineage. So we have two different gene free topologies that we expect to see depending on whether uh, meiosis redeposition was ancestral or delayed. Now, if we um, think back about the way that Scorpius works to build the gene trees, Scorpius um, makes the assumption that um, redipolarization was ancestral because this is uh, the main model. This is what we expect to occur uh, most of the time. And so Scorpius assumes that uh, Synteny have started, has started to already diverge uh, ancestrally and it will predict this sort of topology. But um, I also mentioned that Scorpius does not go against sequence prediction. So that means that when um, delayed redipolarization occurs, sequence will propose a topology that is like this. Um, Scorpius with synteny will, will propose something like that. So we will have a sequence uh, synteny conflict. And when we started to apply Scorpius to this uh, 74 Tilias data set, um, we realized that we had a significant fraction of this sequence synteny conflicts. And so we wanted to really test the, hypo the two hypotheses explicitly. And so that's what we did. Um, we 
took each gene family constrained gene topology to follow either the ancestral reduplication topology or the delayed reduplication one. And then we did likelihood tests to see if for each gene family one uh, model was better supported than the other. And what we found, uh, we found a number of gene families that followed the ancestral reduplication model, but also um, another number of gene families that followed this delayed reduplication model. And these are two examples of such. Uh, families. And so uh, the next step was to put that result back into the whole picture, so the picture of uh, chromosome evolution after the teleotypication. And so what I'm showing here uh, is the Medaka karyotype with all the chromosome indicated here. And they are also labeled uh, with respect to um, the ancestral chromosome. And what we saw is that this uh, delayed gene, gene, fam gene tree family, delayed reduplication gene families were not like randomly scattered uh, across this karyotype. But we saw that there were three entire homologues uh, that displayed this pattern of delayed uh, meiosis resolution. And so what this suggests is that it's not just very localized homologous exchange that you could see, uh, for instance, in allopolyploidy. And uh, to us, this rather suggests that the ancestral teleos was most likely an auto tetraploid because we see three homologous, homologous pairs that were recombining for a long period of time um, across their, their whole length. And we also tested uh, for differences in um, gene retention between the two um, homologues. And for some um, duplicated dupl chromosome, we see um, a signal that one copy has retained more genes that, than the other. Um, but we don't really uh, find that it fits with this subgenome dominance model. And uh, the reason I'm saying that is that because, for instance, chromosome um, 3 and um, 11 here that were behaving like autopolyploid, autotetraploid chromosome for a long period of time also show these differences uh, in gene retention. So this is not due to initial differences between the, the two subgenomes. So yeah, as a conclusion, we really favor the autotetraploid hy hypothesis. And um, so with that, I'm just going to uh, conclude. So we've developed uh, Scorpius, which is a novel method to build accurate gene trees in the context of uh, genome duplication. We uh, found that um, the ancestral teleost um, was subjected to delayed uh, meiosis resolution, and so it was most likely an auto tetraploid. And um, finally, since this is the first time that these uh, phylogenetic models have been used. Um, to identify delayed uh, reduplication in a duplication that is so ancient, uh, we propose that similar methods could be used to uh, investigate the vertebrates duplication, the 1R and 2R uh, duplication at the base of uh, vertebrates. And um, with that, I really want to thank my PhD lab um, and my uh, collaborator uh, for their work um, on this my current lab as well, and especially my um, very supportive PIs. And um, thank you. Thanks a lot for listening, and I'm happy to take questions if you have them. Oh, thank you so much for a really interesting talk. Um, as always, if folks have questions, please feel free to pop those in the chat box or turn on your audio video and wave your hand and we'll Feel free to ask away. Usually, usually at a little bit of a delay here, a little delayed questioning, like delayed ridiculously. <laughs> Although, no, Justin is flagging us down. <laughs> Justin, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, uh, thanks for a great talk, Lucas. I, re I really enjoyed that. Um, I wonder if if you have any estimate for like how long these chromosomes that look to be delayed redeploidization, how long are they still recombining? Like, do you still see them in the extant uh, fishes today, or can you only infer them like? at a certain divergence points in the phylogeny that you're looking at? Yeah, so um, today they don't recombine in, in meiosis anymore, in extant teleos. Um, 
with this test that we have, we can um, say for sure that it has uh, recombined at least um, during this time, so at least 16 million years after the, the duplication. Uh, in this work, we did not really explicitly test uh, when it stopped, uh, whether or not it stopped before uh, the first osteoclast form diverged, before the first uh, Clupocephala diverged. Um, I had a quick look at the data, and what I believe happened is that it was completely redeployed before Clupocephala diverged. And for the osteoclastiform, it took a little bit longer, like the first group started to diverge before it was resolved, and then it was quickly resolved. So I would say it was completely resolved uh, for all TDRs around uh, 100, 150 million years ago. So 100 million okay. years after the duplication, probably. Cool. That's fascinating. I don't know that I've ever heard of the autopolyploid existing like that for 100 <laughs> million years without diplodizing. So that's really cool results. Thanks for sharing them. Thank you. Yeah, we have a question in the chat there. You well, if you want to come pop online and ask, or I can read it out. All right. Well, the question is: Do you know whether this delayed redipolization is also observed in plants? Um, I don't know. Um, I haven't worked with uh, plants, but that's something that, that could be tested. Um, I don't know. Yeah, I, I'll just say, I think the the closest example is probably the, the one that, the only one that comes to mind that might be this case um, is the from uh, Allison Scott's work on the, the redwoods. So the it looks like that's a, you know, a, a very old auto polyploidy that's basically looks like it's been maintained right for about i think i feel like this is all off the top of my head uh 30 35 million years um okay. so but it's also a a dawn it's also a, a sequoia or redwood so it's sort of um got a really long generation time so i you know, i feel like one of the things that's interesting in plants is to, to think about you have such different scales of generation times from uh, you know herbaceous and annual lineages versus um these long-lived trees what you know, when you scale that per million year versus sort of per generation, it might be pretty similar. I've always wondered that with that, yeah. but that's the one, that's the one example that comes to mind. Maybe other folks have other things that want to pop in here. I know there's a, a big uh, plant contingent here. So, oh, uh, Ingo, yeah, feel free to jump in. Yep. Uh, hi, Lise, great talk as always. Um, is there any difference in the functional categories of genes that redeploidize early on and those that Redeploidize later. So um, what we see is that for these um, genes that redeploidize very late, and that we're on these three uh, chromosomes, there's no real bias in function. And I guess that's probably what we expect because these are entire chromosomes; they're not just one function. Uh, for those that are more like scattered, I would say we see a bit of functional um, enrichment in. Uh, signaling pathways that like, such as um, TGF signaling. So uh, we can imagine that maybe it have been maintained um, uh, due to some selective pressure on this um, on these pathways. Well, thanks. Thank you. I think we have time for one more question here. If there's another before we switch over, maybe uh, at least you can go ahead and stop sharing so Ben can pop on there. All right. Well, if there are any other questions for Elise, we'll come back to those at the uh, end of the symposium here, at the end of the, the webinar, so that um, so save those uh, until then. All right. And now I'd like to um, welcome our second speaker for the day, uh, Ben Blonder. Uh, ben is a, an ecologist focusing on plant response to climate change. He received his PhD at the University of Arizona and was a Natural Environmental uh, Research Council Independent Research Fellow at the Environmental Change Institute at the University of Oxford. Uh, he is currently an assistant professor at the University of California, Berkeley, in the Department of Environmental Science, Policy, and Management, and previously was an assistant professor at Arizona State University's School of Life Sciences. And while he's also interested in improving science education uh, through exper experiential approaches, 
Uh, here at the University of Arizona, he helped co-found the University of Arizona Sky School, a program that provides inquiry-based outdoor science education uh, to K through 12 students throughout the Southwest. Uh, and today he's going to talk to us and virtually be back here in Tucson um, and talk to us uh, about uh, what I think is a really interesting work that, that's been happening uh, uh, in his lab on on quaking aspen and here with the question of why are there so many triploid quaking aspen if they are sterile. With that, I'll let you take it away, Ben. Thanks, Mike, for the introduction. Um, I'm here to give a, a talk on one of my favorite tree species, and this is a bit of an early stage project, so I'm, I'm primarily here to get some feedback from everybody. So please... Your, your critical ideas are, are very welcome. Um, this will be a little bit of a jump from um, comparative genetics in fish all the way to um, genetics within a single species, uh, quaking aspen, and I'll introduce you first to the, the, the focal organism. So this is the most widely distributed uh, tree species in North America. You can see a range map here on the right with range um, all the way up in Northern Canada and Alaska down to Central and Southern Mexico. Um, it often grows clonally, it's dioecious and um, relevant to our seminar series today. Um, it is commonly found either in diploid or triploid um, forms. Um, in some places, it's it's a very early successional species, and in other places, it's it's late successional. So, sort of a jack of all trades from an ecological perspective. Um, if you haven't seen it on, on landscapes, this is a, a quick view of aspen forests in southwestern Colorado. Pretty much everything here that is not this sort of conifer patch on the top is quaking aspen. So it's very ecologically dominant in many landscapes and forms these monodominant um, stands that are, are very beautiful to walk through and are of a lot of uh, management interest in uh, many countries as well. So just to give you a sense of the phenotypic variation we're talking about, I, I pulled some pictures from north to south in the range. So here's up in Alaska, here's in Colorado, some really tiny individuals growing on mountaintops, um, grows in pretty riparian areas in the southeast. Um, down in some pretty miserable conditions in, in the uh, West Texas. Um, down in Mexico, you'll find it as habitat for, for parrots, which is pretty incredible. And uh, we have a photo of what we think is one of the southernmost individuals in the world here in Jalisco in, in Mexico as well. So pretty, pretty cool tree. Um, an interesting fact about it is that triploids are, are common throughout the species range. So most um, individuals are diploid in some places, but triploids are actually quite common in others. And there have been two great studies of this by Karen Mock and then um, Roscoe Essen in the last decade or so. You can see some little pie charts here with um, percent uh, triploid in blue on the left and then percent triploid in red on the right. And uh, those pie slices are pretty big in, in many places. So there's a lot of triploids um, in this species. And in our own um, work in my lab, uh, which we just started a, a couple of years ago, um, we've done some ground-based surveys in, in Colorado, um, installing randomly located and gridded little field plots and classifying cytotypes there. And we find that in some places, it's actually up to 75% triploid um, on these landscapes. Um, so it's, it's a lot of triploids. And this, this didn't bother me at, at first, um, but the longer I thought about it, the weirder it, it seemed to me, because I had also read um, that triploids are often sterile. Um, and uh, as a consequence of that, you might think they're evolutionary dead ends. So what are they doing taking up so much of the landscape across the range of this species? So that, that puzzle is what this talk is, is all about. So how, how could we end up with a triploid? Well, I think there's a couple pathways that might be, be relevant. Um, and these are all um, thinking within the species and not, not thinking about any sort of interactions with, with other species. So uh, this, the one, one clear out is that you can get um, haploid and diploid gametes coming together. And that, that could occur if you had tetraploid and diploid parents, or alternatively, if you had unreduced gametes from a 2N parent, meaning reduced gametes also from a, a diploid parent. Um, so that, that's one reasonable pathway. Another is that a, a 3N parent could, could maybe just um, pass along um, some, some 3N gametes and then maybe not reproduce with anybody else and off it goes as a 3N individual into the, the, the happy future. Um, and then of course, a, a last and maybe less likely mechanism is that during vegetative growth, a diploid, haploid or a tetraploid individual could accidentally end up being triploid and then those cells would outcompete the others and um, those, those triploid cells would then become the vegetative body of the, the organism. So all of these mechanisms are, are plausible in principle, but there's some problems with all of them the, the, the more we think about them. Um, one of the, the first interesting things, um, and I'll get back to this in a second with some of these issues, is that um, while the species is dioecious, it's not, it's not really dioecious. Um, it often produces um, hermaphrodite individuals. Um, so sometimes you get um, perfect flowers. Um, and in some places, as reported here, they can be up to about 
um, 20 percent of the population. So the, the sort of sexual reproduction mode um, potentially constrains some of those um, gamete transfer mechanisms and leads to some interesting outcomes, especially with regard to the triploid producing triploid offspring, offspring growth. Um, and then, of course, the, the biggest issue, um, which um, I mentioned briefly, is that most people think triploids should be sterile or at least very low um, fitness um, due to the um, likelihood that um, gametes would be aneuploid. Um, that is, you wouldn't get the chromosome segregating successfully. Um, so that, that seems to be the, the fatal objection, but there, there are more. Um, so even if they weren't sterile, um, in nature, we, we never see tetraploid or um, haploid individuals. So it really seems to just be, be diploids and uh, triploids on the landscape. Um, and then this sort of self-reproduction idea seems pretty unlikely given the, the diacy of the species. And as I mentioned here, you have this, this sort of interesting complication with sex. And then also this 50 to 75% level of triploids seems um, pretty high for um, any of these N plus 2N pathways to, to generate populations like that if the fitness levels are really so low. So a lot of, a lot of things seem to be arguing against the very strong empirical pattern. Um, so where, where do we go from there? Um, and before I go there, I'll, I'll just point out this, this review paper. So this is a Sarah Otto paper um, arguing that triploid individuals tend to have severely reduced fitness. So it's not, it's not necessarily just me feeling this way, but I, I would say a lot of literature um, holding up triploids as sort of um, evolutionary dead ends. So this, this might be an interesting case where they either are, but something interesting is happening or where they aren't, and also something interesting is happening. So how could, how could we solve the puzzle? So here's um, four ideas to offer which we're gonna try and test in the talk. One of the first ideas is that, well, maybe the triploids are actually high, high fitness. Um, so maybe they have very strong ability to compete vegetatively. And that's enough that even if they do have these prezygotic or postzygotic barriers to reproduction, um, namely low fertility or low viability of seedlings, um, their success at other life stages sort of outweighs that. And um, they're able to persist on the landscape. And because this is a species that we know has a long lifespan and clonal growth, um, there are sort of multiple temporal opportunities for any individual to produce at least one successful offspring and maintain its um, genetic signal in the, the population. Um, in some cases, we think these aspen um, forests can, individuals can live for thousands to tens of thousands of years um, and, and reproduce much more frequently than that. So a lot of reproduction could be occurring. A second possibility is that triploid fitness is actually always low. And all of the triploids we see are really sink populations. They're sort of accidents that occurred and they're on the landscape, but they're not doing anything. They compete very well vegetatively, but they never reproduce. Um, and conversely, this long lifespan and clonal growth, this could also simply promote them persisting on the landscape and, and taking up space. A third possibility um, is more of a coexistence theory sort of argument, which is that maybe in fluctuating environments, uh, occasionally triploids um, have high fitness, um, maybe in particular conditions, let's say more mesic ones, they grow faster and the vegetative benefit of being triploid outlined in hypothesis one becomes super strong and that's enough to outweigh the, the downsides um, that would otherwise occur. And then a, a last possibility, which gets into some historical biogeography is that, well, maybe triploid fitness was high at some point, maybe in the early Holocene when climates were very different in North America, especially in these montane locations, um, but it's low today. And the reason we still see triploids is that they're, they're sort of ghosts. They're, they're getting selected out, but they haven't been selected out yet due to the long generation time um, of, of the species. So with these hypotheses, how could we possibly um, uh, test them and roll, roll some of them out? Well, we can at first just have some ideas about plausibility. So the, the first one um, seems possible, but we, we don't really know what the mechanisms would be. And not much data there. The second one um, seems unlikely because there's just so many triploids on the landscape and it seems just gut feeling that your unreduced gamete production rate would need to be really, really high for this, this to work out. The third possibility also seems plausible and um, there's been a lot of ecophysiology arguments in this direction, but just like hypothesis one, we don't know how it would work if it did occur. And in the last possibility, um, this historical argument, this seems unlikely because we know um, rapid drought mortality of this species does occur and indeed has been a, a major management concern in North America over the last couple of decades. So it seems to respond quickly to, um, to um, selective forces when, when called upon to do so. So if we wanted to make progress, we'd have to measure some of the parameters that would underlie any of these um, sort of reproductive mechanisms, but it's hard to do that because you, you have to find the trees when they're reproducing and the measurements themselves are 
are quite difficult um, as well. Um, this, this species in particular reproduces sexually in very early um, spring, often when there's um, very challenging field work conditions with a lot of snow and avalanche risk. So it's, it's not trivial necessarily to get the data you would, you would want to have. So instead of um, trying to get some real data, I'm going to propose an alternate approach, um, which involves the following workflow. So first of all, we'll, we'll build some sort of conceptual mathematical model um, about how floaty level frequencies could change within a population over time, um, building off a model published by Husband et al. in 2004. And in this model, we could imagine that we could have um, fitnesses, survivals, um, gamete production rates, et cetera, for individuals of a particular floaty level, and then also probabilities that um, an individual of a certain floaty level could produce gametes or offsprings of a different floaty level. Um, once we have the model, we can then get some observed data on floaty level frequencies that we do know, and that's literature review. That's sort of like the data I showed you at the beginning. And then third, um, we can do some mathematical tricks and we can find out the parameters of the model in stage one that are most consistent with the observations that we have in, in part two. Um, I'll, I'll do this for you, and it's currently via a very naive grid search algorithm, and in the future it'll be something more robust, but the, the talk deadline snuck up on me very quickly, so we're, we're going to see some preliminary results. And then um, last, based on the parameters that we infer, um, we can then roll in or roll out some of those hypotheses, so a strong inference framework for, for getting at this without having to do any field work. So the, the model itself um, is, is actually quite simple. It's about 50 lines of R code right now. Um, so we iterate over multiple generations. We start out with some individuals in the population. Um, right now we're saying they're all diploid to begin with. And we'll say each individual can then produce some gametes, um, either of the same floaty level or different floaty levels, anywhere from haploid to tetraploid. Um, and there's some parameters describing each of those production rates. Um, and this is sort of like a fecundity matrix um, for these, these four different classes. Then we assume there's random mating inside of that population where offspring or rather gametes meet other gametes um, in some sort of big mixing mixing bowl. Um, and the offspring then are the sum of the um, floaty levels of the two um, parent gametes. Um, so that puts all the key processes in except for somatic mutations. And that's something we're, we're not tackling here. That, that seems too hard. Um, after the offspring are produced, we then say there's differential survival, which is uh, also determined by floaty level. Um, and after survival has occurred, we, we don't allow the population to grow or shrink. So this is a frequency model. Um, we normalize to the same number of total individuals and then repeat the mating process again and again until an equilibrium is, is reached. Um, and then we return the floaty level frequencies after iterating the model forward for some large amount of time. Um, so the assumptions here, and th these may be critical later on, um, we're assuming that, um, sorry, this should be simultaneous generations. Um, identical lifespans for all of the individuals, a constant environment, constant response to environment, and then also no frequency dependent selection. And the reasons that those are not included is that the model already has a ton of parameters and putting more in, I think, would, would make the um, approach sort of intractable. So we're starting with the simplest possible approach and seeing if it tells us anything interesting and only if needed will we make it more complex. So this ends up with 21 free parameters. Um, number one, there's how many generations to run, and this gets at some of those disequilibrium ideas. Number two, there's the matrix of the gamete production probabilities for each of the different ploidy levels. And then um, this survival fitness um, probability, or not, not probability, but survival fitness for each of the different um, ploidy levels as well. So we get 21 parameters to deal with. Um, and an example of what this model looks like when it's run, if you pick some realistic parameters, um, can be seen here. So the lines are different ploidy levels, and then time is just arbitrary generation time steps. And you can see here, this is a case where we have a primarily diploid population, some triploids, a couple tetraploids, and, and no haploids at all. Um, so we'll basically be doing this for many different parameter sets and then extracting the results at some later period in time and then doing some inference on that. So what I've decided to do, um, and again, this is just very preliminary for now, um, I've decided to figure out which parameters best match a population that's 50% diploid and 50% triploid, or at least within 10% of that. Um, and then also has less than 10% tetraploids and a less than 25% unreduced gamete production rate for diploid parents. Um, so these, these are basically empirical constraints that relatively well match what we see in nature. Um, and any, any simulation effectively has to hit these targets or we know it's going to be unrealistic. All of the other parameters we allow to be free and to vary. 
Um, and in this case, we're running for 20 generations, which probably represents a couple thousand years of time in, in many cases um, to see what happens. And I've done 4,000 runs so far um, just for computational reasons, but eventually this would be a much more um, exhaustive um, and more plausible simulation process. But even with the, the limited preliminary analyses, I think we'll see some interesting things. So if we do this, what do we find? What are the distributions of plausible parameters? So here, what we have is a pairs plot of, um, let's see, six of the key parameters. So we have uh, triploid survival as the first column, then tetraploid survival as the next column. And these are all um, normalized relative to diploids who have a survival um, of one, recalling that this is a, a relative population model rather than an absolute population model. And then we have the probability that uh, diploid individuals produce diploid gametes, um, triploid individuals producing haploid gametes, triploid individuals producing diploid gametes and, and triploid gametes. So this is some, some of the sort of key unknown things that might be going on in the system. And you can see here that the model does have a solution. And among the parameter space um, selected, only a fairly restricted set of the parameter space ends up with a plausible solution. Some of the variables look like they can vary independently and others seem to show a strong correlation with each other. So this is telling us that this um, problem does have a solution. Um, but it's a fairly limited um, evolutionary parameter space that we've we've converged in to, to make it work out. And if we look at this in a simpler way, um, just as marginal distributions on each of the parameters, we can see what we're really talking about here is a case where triploids have a survival of about 1.5, which is 50% higher than diploids. Tetraploids on average have a survival of about 50%, so half as much as diploids. Um, Diploids producing unreduced gametes, that's the third column here, um, at some non-zero, but pretty pretty low rate, maybe like 10%. Um, and then, uh, interestingly, the triploids um, producing viable gametes um, at relatively high and non-zero rates as well, and in particular, gametes of, of different floaty levels. Um, so th this is effectively a hypothesis about what you would find if you did a bunch of cytological studies or genomic studies inside of reproductive tissue inside of plants, and it's, it's a very falsifiable prediction. Um, it then makes you ask, though, well, are these parameters actually realistic? So what if we constrain these further? So what if we, what if we say, well, what if we believe that triploids are sterile, meaning that they, they can't make any viable gametes of any type? Um, so we're only allowing for the, the route of diploids producing unreduced gametes to, to carry us through and potentially get us up to tetraploids and, and then go back from there. If we do that, the model has no solution. Um, it just it does not work. So it seems to be necessary that the, the triploids are um, are fertile for this to work out. Um, another question would be, well, what if what if the for the triploid fertility, what if they can only make triploid gametes? So they can't make either haploid or diploid gametes. In this case, we do get some solutions, but it, it's a very narrow part of the parameter space that makes things work out. Um, again, this is a pretty limited amount of computation so far. More, more computation might make this look a little bit bigger, but I think the general conclusion of this being an, a narrow road to success is probably going to hold up. And then what if we ask the, the converse of that, what if triploids can never make triploid gametes? So they, they can only uh, make haploid or, or diploid, diploid gametes. In this case, we get a slightly bigger range of the parameter space to, to come together. Um, and if we look at the marginal distributions here, what you can see happens is that we now assume that um, triploid survival is much higher than it was beforehand. So the triploids effectively need to perform vegetatively much better than they would have otherwise in order to, to deal with this loss of um, triploid gametes. Um, tetraploid survival also has to be higher, although there's a lot of uncertainty, it looks like, in the distribution here. So need to do more computation. And we have about the same story for the, the diploids producing unreduced gametes. Um, so again, another, another hypothesis that could be very easily tested with real data. Um, another thing you could do is you could run the model for variable amounts of time, and that would test some of those disequilibrium ideas. Haven't done that yet, um, didn't have the time, but I think you could get some pretty clean conclusions. And just based on looking at time series, it looks like equilibrium in this model is reached very quickly. And it seems um, unlikely that any of those um, slow response to selection arguments would be likely um, to hold up in a, in a case like this. So in terms of conclusions, then, where does, where does this leave us? Um, it suggests that high triploid prevalence in this species can occur when triploid survival is much higher than that of diploids, and when tetraploid survival is non-zero, but lower than that of diploids, and where diploids produce unreduced gametes at some reasonably high rate, and triploids produce reduced gametes that are viable. Um, and having triploids that are perfectly sterile is completely incompatible with, with nature. Um, 
And it doesn't seem to be necessary that we need to invoke any disequilibrium arguments to, to make the, the pattern work out. So if you dig a little bit harder into the literature um, and ask a little bit more about triploid sterility in populace, um, and you look at the closely related species populace tremula, there's, there's one study on this from 1940 um, by this guy Johnson, and he has some beautiful photos of some um, offspring of um, diploid crosses and diploid by triploid crosses, and down here the diploid by triploid cross you can see produced an offspring, so some, something was successful there. Um, between between those two. So this suggests that the triploid are indeed um, not sterile in this closely related species. And if you look at some of the other trials done by, by this person, um, crossing, um, uh, looking actually at seed production rates, you can again see in some of these um, triploid by diploid crosses, you do get um, seed production. And if you look at vegetative success of those offspring, um, you can see that among the individuals that are planted, um, they, they do die back um, over the months of growth, but they don't all die. Um, and indeed, probably most, most plants grown in a greenhouse would, would die if um, taken care of as well. So, so this is suggestive that they, they can pass through both the um, seed production and then the initial seedling growth stage. Um, it just does not seem to have really have been observed in tremuloides yet. Um, that, though, however, seems to be changing now. So there's this beautiful study by um, Roscoe SN just published a couple of months ago, actually. Um, she's done a big greenhouse study in Canada, um, and she has now also observed um, successful germination from offspring of triploid mothers. That's the stars here. And um, in some cases, um, they seem to produce triploid offspring as well. So it's rare, um, but it does seem to occur. Um, so the big open question now is, um, what's really happening in nature and across that species range. But I think we can at least bury, bury the, the false hypothesis that triploids have to be sterile in this species, and um, except that there's probably some very complex and interesting mechanisms occurring, allowing these triploids to be so common on the landscape. So if we go back to the hypotheses, um, we can now say high triploid fitness, that sounds plausible. Um, we can reject the hypothesis about low triploid fitness. Uh, we don't need to think about the fluctuating environment hypothesis, and we probably also don't need to think about the lag from the early Holocene hypothesis. So I'm going to leave the presentation there um, and just thank a number of people for helping make this work happen. I'd love some feedback ideas. You're welcome to email me as well, and thank you for your attention. All right. Well, thank you so much, uh, Ben, for a really uh, interesting and wonderful talk. Um, uh, as always, if folks have questions, feel free to raise your hand or put them in the chat box. All right, I see John's popping up there. Hey, Ben, really nice talk. <clears throat> Such a cool system. And uh, yeah, I thought it was great. So some of those uh, parameters really are going to be impossible for you to ever estimate, even with really good, uh, with really good field work. I mean, knowing the fitness of a clone in a uh, that's going to live for hundreds of years, knowing what, what the fitness was when it established from seed, all of that it seems just completely impossible, um, at least in a human lifetime to measure. But some of those parameters could be pretty easy to measure, um, particularly the, the production of gamete um, frequency. Um, there's a method called, and I'm not sure if you're familiar with it, called the flow cytometric seed screen, where mm -hmm. you Okay, well, you can measure the endosperm and embryo ploidy of seeds, and you can do this very efficiently, and it can get you an idea of what background ploidy of your pollen is, as well as the background production of unreduced versus reduced gametes, uh, re reduced uh, egg cells. And maybe getting seed would be a little bit easier than actually measuring the, the um, production of reproductive material at, at, at least early in the season sure, but it seemed like at least a feasible way to measure some of these traits in situ. Thanks for that feedback. And I, I think that um, makes a lot of sense to me. Um, we have a collaborator, Karen Mock, on this project who um, is in the process or has done a little bit of that. And we, I think we can probably empirically constrain a couple of those parameters a little bit better than they, they look like in this model. And I'll, I, I haven't propagated that through yet, and I'll be really curious to see what the implications are, are going to be. Um, I think my, my feeling with the work overall is that I'm, I'm not sure that the, the value of this work is going to be in trying to parameterize it perfectly given some of the, the structural issues with the model around generation time and um, uh, lifespan and, and um, environment uh, dependent selection and so on and so forth. So I'm, I'm kind of thinking what I'll probably do with this is leave the model as more of a toy model um, just to articulate that 
that the big the big conclusion of triploid sterility is probably probably false and call that good enough. Um, but I would be interested to know from anybody here if, if there would be interest or value in trying to go further than that in a in a study like this. Thanks. All right. Uh, up next is uh, Hussein. Yeah, uh, really cool talk. Um, I was wondering if you, if anyone has looked in this system for uh, evidence of, of apomixis, and whether you know these triploids might be you know, producing clonal seed uh, as a way to you know propagate these triploids at higher frequency than we might expect. That is a great question, and I. I do not know the answer at any level. Um, and that would be something I think probably well worth looking into. Um, I, I simply don't know. And I think it's a really cool idea. All right, we've got a question from uh, Pat. Uh, Pat, if you want to pop online, feel free Hi. to ask or I can read it out. There you go. <laughs> great, great talk, Pat. Uh, so if triploids are so successful in popper, why aren't they much more common in nature than many other species? Yeah, that, that's a great question. And I think that that's something that this, this talk forces us to wrestle with. I, I guess the, the opinion from the auto study um, is that they, they are not because the fertility of the triploids is usually quite low. Um, but I think this model is showing that that it's not necessarily just fertility that determines the answer. You sort of have all these other routes to, to being triploid that I guess could be selected on in some cases if there were, were benefits to being being triploid. Um, I, I see you mentioned banana, and if you wanted to say anything else about that, I'd be interested to hear it. Yeah, well, I know the banana there, the, the crop is, of course, virtually always triploid, but you can breed by crossing with diploids or tetraploids and there's a small amount of residual fertility, which is not unlike what you're uh, finding, but it's still rather, it's still, that that's a different system and it's still a one-off, not universal. Yeah, I think, thanks for sharing that. I, I think it would be interesting actually if somebody were able to do a, a sort of survey of triploid prevalence across species, a big comparative study. I don't know if yeah. there would be enough data out there to do it, but it'd be really interesting. Yeah, definitely. And, uh, and where, where it spreads from where whether there's ever any spread where there are tetraploid and, and diploid populations. Mm -hmm. um, I think there's quite a lot of data from people in Czech Republic on, on some of those in wild populations, but nothing is as terrific and widespread as the popular, certainly. Thanks. Um, ben, to that point about triploids uh, in, in other species, you might look into Bukhara which has a ton of triploids and very rare tetraploids, um, but those are maintained through apomixis. And we know that they do, that there's very little exchange, but when it happens, it's adaptive. That's all. Okay. I'll, I'll look into that. That's a new part of the literature for me. I know Carl's gonna ask a question, but I'm gonna jump in there too, John, uh, and pile on the other examples that I would, that come immediately to mind about triploids are uh, in the calanthoid ferns. Uh, out here in the southwest you know you have tons of uh these odd plates pentaploids as well that survive and all again through apogamy or apomixis uh, which i see john's you know ruining evolutionary models with style i would argue the apo part they're ruining without style but anyway um uh with that bad joke i'll transition to carl's a a question here <laughs> thanks that was super cool ben um and i think you explained this to us but maybe you could explain it to me again because i I can't wrap my head around fitness in this system very well. Uh, like what's vegetative reproduction doing? Can you can you explain your results largely based on, on clonality processes? Sure, I'll, let me go back to the beginning and I'll show you some of the data that we had before this, this study kicked off. Um, bear with me just a second, we got a lot of animations here. There we go, okay. So um, we did this study back in, this is actually 2018, but it took a couple of years to get published. Um, we set up um, forest plots in Colorado, randomly located. Um, that's all the, the dots on this landscape. And then also some big intensive um, grids, which are sort of the big fuzzier dots, which are just a lot of closer points. And that's what you see zoomed in here on the right. Um, so at each of these points, we, we inferred the um, floaty level and then also whether or not the individual um, stem was, um, a clone of another individual nearby or happened to be a, a new genotype. 
And um, the colors on the backgrounds here, so these sort of background shadings show us the, the clone boundaries. And then the, the dots in the center tell us the, the floaty level. So what you can see is that in, in many cases, um, we do have many clones even at fairly fine spatial scales. Um, you can see the scale bars here um, and a lot of sort of mixing and matching and um, interdigitating as well. But then every once in a while, you do get these, these bigger clones. So it, it is possible that in some places, a lot of what we see is actually not high triploid prevalence from a um, frequency in the population perspective, but high triploid prevalence from a taking up space on the land perspective. Um, and that, that could certainly adjust some of the numbers down. But I, I think it's tricky because from an ecological perspective, competition and reproductive outcomes are determined by space on the land um, as well. And if this, this genotype here is taking up a ton of space, it's effectively using resources that many other genotypes could be using instead. So I, I, I feel actually quite conflicted about how this all plays out and how to best think about it. And I'd be, be curious about your thoughts. It's interesting, just eyeballing it here, like the diploids tend to have small clones. Is that consistent? Um, I don't know. We only have data for, for here. Um, and when we set up the study, we, we put these grids in places that look like they'd be relatively easy to do field work in um, and seem to have a lot of diversity in canopy structure. So it's, it's a semi-random but not totally random structure. And we don't, we don't know more in general. Um, we have done some remote sensing work to try and map out the diploids and triploids. And actually at landscape scale, um, this pattern of 75% triploid drops to about 56% triploid, I think. But there's a lot of mixing in between. And from that data, we don't really know if these are different clones um, of the same floaty level or just one gigantic clone over the whole landscape. Yeah, the, the remote sensing can't tell us that yet. It's a, a great mystery. All right, well, just to keep us moving here, we'll have, I think, one last question before we wrap it up from uh, Justin Ramsey. Justin, go ahead. Hey, great talk. And my question is probably quite similar um, actually to Carl's, but I mean, I, I wonder if there's any chance that the sterility of triploids or low fertility of triploids is actually an advantage in the sense that they're not putting energy into making pollen or developing ovules. And so, basically they have a it's like instantaneous mechanism to become sterile and mm. then they can sprawl and i think in the old literature um there are cases where they find that triploids would tend to sprawl and so you see them as sort of these asexual um clumps and i guess i this is similar to what you were saying i wonder if you had microsatellite markers or something to look at the size of these clones if that might um, the size and identity of the clones, if that might speak to some of the what's going on um, in terms of fitness or fertility. Yeah, that, that's a great point. And, and certainly um, collaborators have, have looked to see if diploids or triploids make bigger clones. And it does look like, at least in the, the Western part of the continent, that the triploids make bigger clones in the species. Um, so I, I think that's a reasonable argument. I, I guess the thing that's surprising to me is is that it doesn't seem likely that reproduction is actually a very high cost in this this species. So they they're um, they're, they're generally asexual in most years, and until usually after a fire, and then they they go for a big pulse of of um, fluffy seeds in the early early spring. But it can be many years between that happens. And to my eye, at least, the amount of carbon that gets invested in making the the fluff is pretty minimal compared to the amount of investment that goes into making a, a canopy. Um, I don't have data for that, but just thinking about like weighing it all up, I think it would be pretty pretty small. Um, so it, it doesn't seem to me that that the physical structures are a big cost of reproduction, but I, I could be wrong. All right. Well, I think we'll wrap it up there since we're running uh, running over time now. Uh, uh, if there are any other questions, I'm sure that uh, you should feel free to email uh, either Elise or Ben uh, about their, their work here. These are two wonderful talks today, very thought provoking and uh, and really wonderful to to hear about the, some of those latest advances on the on the genomic side as well, and, and fishes, uh, and the parallels to plants, and and um, and always fun to think about polyploids out there in the landscape and competition among these uh, platy levels. So thank you, Ben. Um, with that, I'll I'll just close out by saying uh, we'll be back here next month on March first uh, for the next uh, polyploid webinar uh, that will feature. Uh, Hannah Asor and, and Alyssa, uh, Alyssa Phillips uh, should be an, another great series. Um, and I also just want to highlight, I'm 
You muted yourself. It muted me when I did that. That's funny. Um, <laughs> I hit enter on the uh, on the on the uh, Polypoid conference link there. Apologize for that. Um, the Polypoid conference is posted a link there in the meeting chat. Um, the meeting will take place May 9th to the 12th uh, in Palm Coast, Florida. Uh, the website's up, and I'm told that the registration costs will be posted this week. Um, that uh, folks are working on continue to get funding to bring that cost down to make it as low as possible for uh, everyone to attend. Um, so I uh, keep an eye out for that. And again, abstracts are due on February 17th. But otherwise, we'll see everyone back here on March 1st for our, our next talk from Alyssa, uh, next two talks from Alyssa uh, uh, Phillips and Hannah uh, Sor. All right. Uh, thank everyone for attending today. And again, thank you to Ben and Elise for two wonderful talks. Thanks, Elise. Thank Thanks, Mike. Thank you.